This is Duke University. Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Matt Nash, and I was until a few days ago the executive director of CASE, the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship, and I'm proud to say Aaron Worsham is our new executive director for CASE and is with us uh, here tonight. And on behalf of the entire CASE team, I'd like to welcome you to our award session tonight. Thank you for coming. This is our, our fifth annual award presentation for the CASE Award for Enterprising Social Innovation. It's just one of a number of events we have this week. Uh, encourage you to pick up some flyers at the back. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, we are uh, having, in partnership with the uh, Duke Global Health Institute, with the International Partnership for Innovative Healthcare Delivery, uh, Investor Circle, and the uh, Developing World Healthcare Technology Laboratory, the first annual Duke Symposium on Scaling Innovations in Global Health tomorrow afternoon from one o'clock to five o'clock. I invite you to join us for that. And then tomorrow night at five o'clock, uh, Case Senior Fellow and two-time New York Times best-selling author Dan Heath will be here. He and his brother Chip just put out a, a book last week, last Tuesday, within a matter of hours. It was already on the Amazon.com uh, top 10 book, and it's called Decisive. It's all about making better decisions in, in work and in life. So I encourage you to come back uh, tomorrow night for that. Tonight is, is a highlight of our year. It's an opportunity to really celebrate an outstanding uh, example of social entrepreneurship. Uh, we like to recognize that this award individuals, organizations, or companies whose innovations blend methods from the worlds of business and philanthropy to create sustainable social value that have potential for a large scale impact. Uh, we have several goals for this award, and to consider nominees, we like to identify and celebrate the traits that these social entrepreneurs must possess in order to be successful in their endeavors, including creativity, commitment, resilience, and results-focused drive to create and sustain positive social impact. And then we really seek to raise public awareness of outstanding individuals, organizations, or companies who endeavor to achieve more effective, more sustainable, and scalable impact through enterprising social innovation. We seek nominations of social entrepreneurs whose work blends methods from business and philanthropy, creates social value that can scale and endure, and challenge the status quo. <coughs> Nominees can come from any field, uh, though CASE has a special interest in social entrepreneurs addressing issues in poverty, health, education, and the environment. Nominations are accepted from across the Duke community and the public at large. 
We're particularly thrilled uh, with tonight's honor. Uh, it's our honor to present the award tonight uh, in, in to a group that we have for a number of years been eager to bring to campus. Uh, and um, you'll hear a lot more about Riders for Health in a moment. But as we thought about uh, the social entrepreneurs around the world who've made a significant difference through models that are really changing systems, uh, Andrea and Barry Coleman are outstanding examples of this concept of enterprising social innovation. And so um, to give a proper introduction to Andrea and Barry and about uh, the Riders for Health, I'd like to call up my colleague, Professor Kathy Clark, to, uh, to, to give a proper introduction. So Kathy? because we really want to hear from them, not us. Um, but I have, uh, I can't think of a better example of this award um, than Barry and Andrea Coleman. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but they were motorcycle enthusiasts to begin with, right? And they befriended a, a um, uh, American motorcycle racing star and decided to go to Somalia with him because he had made a donation there um, and started traveling around and they started looking around and they said, you know, we have terrible health, uh, health outcomes over here and we have these vehicle graveyards over here. Maybe we could, maybe we could do something about that. Um, and so it's been many years later. Um, they have uh, created a solution where they provide fleet management and maintenance. Um, for health-focused partners in sub-Saharan Africa. They are now implementing programs in seven African countries. They are improving access to health care for more than 12 million people, uh, which is quite amazing. Um, I have been trying to get Andrea here for several years, ever since I interviewed her um, for a business model project a few years ago and said, ooh, this is really exciting, and we've been passing at various events. Um, her model is so interesting that when David Bornstein, who many of you may know, who's been writing about social entrepreneurship for many years, wanted to launch his new um, series in the New York Times on things that work, which he calls fixes, he started with Riders for Health, and he called it Healthcare and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, Andrea and Barry are not only intrepid fearless, tireless, successful social entrepreneurs, but they've also been a really important part of the global movement uh, around social entrepreneurship. They've won many awards. Um, they are regular speakers at the School Award Forum. They've participated in the World Economic Forum. Um, and it is my extreme great pleasure to welcome them tonight for this award. So um, good evening. Um, it's a great honor to be here. Um, thank you to Case and to Seed for recognizing our work and for inviting us here. Uh, we're sorry about the weather. We think we might be responsible having brought it from uh, Arctic England. Um, so uh, success is neither magical nor mysterious. Uh, success is a, 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 a natural consequence of constantly applying the basic fundamentals. And we think that what is missing in terms of the success of MDGs, uh, the, the Millennium Development Goals, what's really missing is that people are not looking at the basic fundamentals. And everybody's doing wonderful work, wonderful, wonderful work. But actually, if you cannot get things to the people who desperately need it, it's not going to work. So the, what we really concentrate on is last mile. And we know that's a very big mile. It's a, you know, more like 500, very difficult, very challenging miles. So that's, that's the work that we took on 25 years ago. <coughs> so um, I'd like to just set a little bit of a context here. Um, we've got a, a very very short film just to give you an idea and I know so many of you work in these very challenging areas so it will be no surprise to you but I think it might be just helpful just to play a very short video just to show you the sort of work an example of the sort of work that we're doing What do you think? Oh, yeah. 
the beginning this is really not a very narrow piece of animal track so a motorcycle could it'll get better make <laughs> sure that everybody is mobile in this really difficult terrain this is Bonanka Health Center it's 30 kilometers from the nearest town but that journey takes an hour and a half by car let alone by bicycle or on foot Joseph Sakala is one of the two nurses here who struggle to keep up with demand. Some of these people seem as if they've walked huge distances to get here. Yes, yes, of course. The fairest point is about maybe 15 <coughs> kilometers or so. Well, that's a day's walk, isn't it? Yes, it's a day's walk. That's amazing. A key part of Joseph's work is diagnosis, but his equipment is limited. For many patients, he has to send their sputum and blood samples to the district laboratory, 30 kilometers away in Chadisa. So Riders is setting up a new program in Zambia, starting with a motorcycle courier system for medical samples. Violet, having been fully trained to ride safely and maintain her motorcycle, is about to become Zambia's first rider for health. People are counting on me and I believe it will be something big and knowing that I'm part of it, it will be awesome. Violet and her fellow riders will be visiting each of the district's 15 remote rural health clinics every couple of days. And one of the first is Joseph. With their coming, I'm so very happy that the whole program the whole chain of health service won't be interrupted. It will be quick. Imagine the patient comes today, leaves the maybe the sputum specimen, and then Violet comes, picks the specimen, and then she brings back the results after a day or two. Oh, I'm happy. <laughs> What that shows you really is that um, one of the things we did there with the sample couriers is that really you're looking at maybe two weeks, three weeks, maybe even months before people normally get their results back. And that just cuts down the system, cuts the, down the time dramatically. So that just shows you what transport will do when you take the walking out of the, out of the equation. So <clears throat> I'd just like to give a little bit of a background to our work. Um, we're supported by a new museum that's in uh, Tacoma in um, uh, Washington State. It's a museum uh, about the American car. It's to show what the American dream of cars is all about and what America has been built on. And it, they support Riders for Health. They, they donate money to us because they think of us as something uh, that they feel resonates with what they do. And they really are showing how America was built, the infrastructure that the economy is built on, and, and what really the car has done for the United States. And it just tells you really how much we take this for granted in our environments. We just take transport and logistics so much for granted. And it, it, it's very interesting for us to see that development over the last hundred years about what the engine uh, has done. So we really then look at, at, at Africa where the Industrial Revolution just bypassed it, simply bypassed Africa. No engines, no technicians, no understanding of, of engines because why, why would anybody have had that training? So we set about doing, really putting in place what would maintain the vehicles. And, and when Barry speaks in a moment, he'll explain our work and, and his part of the work and how he's developed those systems in, in Africa. 
And it, we find it interesting because um, the Queen, British Queen, um, looked at, uh, had, a, had a sort of thought, obviously, recently, and thought, you know, there's a Nobel Prize for all sorts of things, but there's nothing for engineers. And I'm going to set up a prize, the Queen's Award for Engineers. And we thought it was very interesting because Britain has been known for mechanical development for many years. But the awards, brand new award, went to technology, to new technology, to the internet, to, which is great. And we applaud it and love it, and none of us could do without it. But everybody forgets the old technology. Now, my family, one of the reasons we started Riders for Health, Barry and I together, we both come from a motorcycle background. We love motorcycles. But my father was a development engineer. My brother was a development engineer. I used to race motorcycles. So we know a bit about them. And so we feel that there's something really seriously missing about the basic fundamentals, that if you don't get the logistics and the movement to right, nothing's going to move. And it's very interesting. We, we feel that new technology and old technology are perfect partners, a perfect marriage. But everybody's beginning to think that somehow you can leapfrog over the old technology and just use new technology, mobile phones and and E health and M health, as people call it. But there's a difference between mobile phones and mobility. You've actually got to get the physical, you've got to get people together. You've got to get the professional health worker together with the patient. You've got to get, you can't deliver, you can't do a C-section or give a child an immunization with a mobile phone. You can get the information back and forth and the data, and that's fabulous. We're per perfect partners, but don't forget the real mobility. So can I just scroll down here? Excuse me. Um, what we've focused on, really, uh, is last mile. And it's, it's a pretty much ignored um, part of, uh, of the health system because it's difficult. It's difficult and it's expensive to deal with. So we know that, just as we've seen in that little film, there are millions of little logistics needs to, that we can tailor-make because we maintain the vehicles and you can tailor-make solutions for health. So there's compliance. Are people taking their antiretrovirals? Are they self-transport, the, the film you just saw? There are so many different kinds of things, child nutrition, health, uh, public health, uh, and so on. So those are the issues that we deal with. But social enterprise is, um, is something that sort of crept up on us in a way. When we started Riders, we didn't think that, we knew nothing about development. We didn't know about philanthropy. We didn't know about international development. So we just knew we wanted to solve this particular problem and didn't know how we were going to fund it. So we thought, well, we're going to have to earn money. So we earned money by putting on events in motorcycle racing. Um, and uh, um, we really kind of give things, we provide things that people, money can't buy, if you like. So that's how we earn money in Europe and America. And then we spent that, but we... Barry's development was to make sure that governments were paying for the services. So one, of, one day the, the Schwab Foundation came along and said, you're social entrepreneurs. And we said, well, we knew we weren't charity and we knew we weren't business. We just thought we were really, really odd. <laughs> and so all, all of a sudden people like uh, Case come along and say, social enterprise is a really good thing. You're not odd. You're just very disruptive. So um, I think that's... Um, one of the things that um, social entrepreneurs are, and I read that <clears throat> part of uh, Greg Dee's um, work is, is based around four Cs, about um, communications, coalitions, credibility, and uh, something I can't remember. Um, but I think that there are two others, <laughs> beginning with C, that are very, very important. One is challenge. Well, you've got to challenge the status quo all the time. If you're not challenging the status quo, we're, not, we're just going to leave the world the, w the way it is today. And we know that all our program directors are faced with the status quo every day. They have everything that has normally been done. So you've got to be 
we, we, Barry and I decided we should have t-shirts printed with, we're going to do it anyway, because it's really hard to do and to keep challenging the status quo. And the other one is capital, because um, social enterprise is all about the money. You're not going to get anywhere without the money. So we think about how we're going to make this sustainable and how to earn as much money as we can. But we are constantly challenged by um, the world and money, but I know that's, a, that's the story of every, every social entrepreneur here. Just two little uh, remarks I'd like to make. One of our frustrations and something I'd like the students of social enterprise among you to think about is how do you show that health systems show health outcomes? Because everybody says you can't show the impact. And we know that if you reach people, it's, as it were, the bleeding obvious that health is going to change, health status is going to change. But how you're going to put that and show it in metrics is a real challenge for us. And then, similarly, in the environments in which we work, data gathering and data analysis is very challenging. So if anyone in this room is interested in helping us with those issues, we'd be delighted. But I'd be delighted also to introduce the real Riders for Health person, Barry Coleman. Slight delay here while I organise this. And, uh, this looks pretty simple, so I should be able to manage it. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. I have no idea what I'm going to say, uh, <laughs> not, none at all. I'll think of some. But it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult to follow Andrea. You wouldn't like it, would you? you she's very glamorous and uh, very good at what she does. And it's a nightmare, really. I, I always fall for this. I always say, well, you go first, and I'll go after you. But I'm not going to do that anymore. I've learned my, <laughs> my lesson. Um, I think a lot about uh, why this is so difficult. In 1993, I remember it well, funnily enough. What a shame. <laughs> I remember 1993 so well. But anyway, I'm a very old person, so that's <laughs> I, I, I thought this was all over. I, th I, we'd, we'd, I thought we'd demonstrated very effectively in, in Lesotho that what we do works. Uh, we were able to, uh, uh, a young man, young then, uh, Mahali Masheshwe, who, who worked for the Ministry of Health as a, um, a public health worker, uh, ended up running a little fleet of motorcycles. So it, uh, the fleet grew to 47. Uh, Mahali misled us because actually a human being can only manage 30, but Mahali is not a human being and he managed 47, which is very, a bad, very bad precedent, actually, a remarkable man. And he understood what, what the point was to reach, because of public health worker, to reach all the people all over Lesotho. And uh, we had a fleet of 47 motorcycles and they ran without breaking down for. I'm risking something here now because I'm going to give you the number, but it was seven years, and I think that's 329 machine years. Somebody is good at adding up. You know, multiplication can do that. But Mahali never had a breakdown in those hills or anything, and I thought, of course, that this is great success. And, and I thought, therefore, that it was all over, as it were, by the shouting. And we put this to the World Health Organization. We put it to everybody uh, around, and we said, look, this is how you do this. You want to do it or what? And they said, oh, you know what, we're very busy. Um, we do a lot of reports and stuff. We've got to get them done. <laughs> and uh, we've got a lot of you know, meetings to go to. And we haven't got time for this sort of thing at all. I said, it's only 20 minutes up the road. If you want to go and see a clinic and ask them how their diarrhea numbers are going since the public health workers went and started d digging long drop privies, um, why don't you go up the road, you know, have a look? Yeah, well, we're really busy. <laughs> so they never went. And so we're still more or less where we were. I mean, we people are taking this a little bit seriously, a little bit in places, um, but nothing like seriously enough. I mean, in the Gambia, for example, we've really figured this out. And I, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. 
don't look at me, don't picture me. When I say we in the Gambia or Lesotho, picture the citizens of those countries, not me. I don't do this stuff. Andrea doesn't do it. All our programs are run by nationals of those, <coughs> of those uh, countries and else besides, because when people get to the stage when they're really good at this stuff, they export that knowledge to other countries. So when we started in the Gambia, we couldn't find a decent mechanic to save our lives. So a lot of mechanics who were very good came from Zimbabwe and Nigeria and brought the, these, the Gambian mechanics up to speed. This young woman, whose name is Louise, is one such Gambian mechanic. So, not only do we train a lot of hairy men to do all the things that Louise is doing, but we actually got to the point where we could train young women. And I am absolutely not going to miss for a second the opportunity to give myself credit for that. Because when you see those young, in fact, Muslim women doing something that seems not to be consistent with their culture or their culture as misrepresented, uh, you'll think, well, some woman did that, but no, it was me. <laughs> it was me. I made sure that our program director there, uh, Therese, who is a woman, as her name suggests, um, did it. <coughs> Therese said, well, you know, it's really awkward. And I said, don't care. <laughs> Got to do it. So from, from having no mechanics at all in the Gambia, who really couldn't do this stuff, uh, we, we now have great mechanics and, and, and breaking new ground with how this is done and how we, how, how we <coughs> deliver health care in the Gambia, or at least we help the Ministry of Health to do that. Now, I'm coming back to the basics, the fundamentals that Andrea mentioned, but it's, you end up doing some things that aren't so fundamental, as it turns out, and this you have to be ready for. You have to be ready for all sorts of, Andrew used the expression disruption, that's putting it very nicely, uh, all sorts of gruesome things can and will happen if you're going to run a social enterprise in seven countries in Africa. Trust me, things will go wrong, sometimes they'll go right, but you won't know whether it's right or wrong, you have no idea. Governments change all the time, things happen that make it very difficult. So there is a kind of fundamental thing you have to do, and then there's a very difficult thing where you deal with the unexpected all the time. You deal with unintended consequences, unexpected consequences, that's life. I mean, that's how the world is. You get a lot of that stuff. So in the Gambia, for example, from the days when we were making sure that technicians from Nigeria were training people to do this sort of thing properly, we own all the vehicles that, that the Ministry of Health uses. We own them all, and we lease them to the ministry at a not-for-profit cost. This means that, for example, no out, since this system was put in place, no outreach clinic uh, has ever failed, immunization clinic for children, has ever failed because the transport failed. Has not, has never happened. No woman in threatening labor has failed to be delivered by an ambulance that works, that would trained drivers, paramedics, to, to, to a hospital. They get delivered, there's fuel, the whole thing works. It's run by Gambian people, not by us. <laughs> they do all that stuff. Now, if the, that's true, if I'm telling you the truth here, and I've, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna agree I am, aren't you? Nobody's gonna put their hand up and say, you lying bastard, that's just not true. <laughs> true, isn't it? I'm telling you the truth because I've been nuts to come here and do anything else. And I am a bit nuts, but not that kind of nuts. <laughs> so it's true what I'm telling you. We do that in the Gambia. It's extremely effective. What's the problem? Why isn't there a huge queue of people outside our office in Northamptonshire in the UK, in the beautiful Northamptonshire countryside? Why isn't there a big queue of all the UN agencies? Why aren't they all there? Because they're all complaining about women dying in childbirth. We heard some awful statistics this morning. Absolutely terrible. Actually, I got some worse ones, I <laughs> think, than that. Where's the, where's the queue? Where's the line of people wanting to do what we do in other countries? There's a little bit of trickle once in a while. Where are the other African ministries of health? Why aren't they lining up? Why aren't all the NGOs who profess to be concerned about this sort of thing lining up? That's a question I ask myself all the time. I want to know the answer to this question. People 
politely call that challenges and barriers and all that sort of thing. And it's much worse than that. It's a complete and utter, I'm completely baffled by this. I have no, no grip on it whatsoever. I just don't know the answer. And I keep, I, no, I don't think about it. I think about it all the time. One of the things I'm going to do in a minute before I finally shut up is I'm going to try a new way out today. You're going to be part of my experiment. I'm going to try and find, see if I've got it, see if I've found a new way of stating this problem. And I'm going to, you know those snake oil things they used to do? And they, they put up the boy on the stage, you know, and they say, before he took my medicine, this boy was all that. And I have, I'm going to have an assistant in this matter. I recognize my childhood friend, Professor Dennis Mumby, who teaches down the road at some other, well, call it a university, it's Chapel hey, Hill. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere down in some triangle or other, I don't know, down there somewhere. <laughs> So my dentist has showed up very kindly to see what happens, and I, he is my snake oil boy in this. Okay, you'll see in a minute. Well, you, any, 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 any theatrical assistance would be most welcome. Uh, so I'm going to try and see if we can have another go at this, another way of doing it. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I'm sure that is a problem is that people don't correctly honor the God's work and the Japanese work in engines. We're all, it's never been very good at that, and, and, and now it's worse because everybody thinks it's the engine that's killing us. Everybody goes around in a vehicle with a sudden great big engine, but they still think it's killing us. Great big plane or great big SUV, everybody gets here somehow, but nonetheless, the engine's a bad thing, it's gonna kill us. That's made it worse, but it was, the mechanics have always been undersold and misunderstood. Partially, I think, because people don't understand the absolute glory of an engine. I'm not an engineer, I'm not a car enthusiast, by the way. But we've got to take technicians much more seriously. I was in New York the other day, and I, I stopped in my tracks because I was walking past the Brooklyn uh, Institute for Auto Mechanics, and I stopped. It was very, very cold, and I stopped look at these kids, it was coming out time, and I was, all these young men were on, I didn't see any women, they were all young men in big puffy jackets because it was very cold and they were all huddled up and they were on their way home, I guess. And uh, I, I thought, well, that's a start. At least they've got a nice, big, glamorous building. You should have one of, one of those here. There's a nice university, nice campus. You've got plenty of room out there. You could have a, a Duke University school of auto engineering. Why don't you do that? It would help a lot and people take it seriously and they, you know, <coughs> they wouldn't treat it with the, often with the contempt. So I've, the contempt it doesn't deserve. I, 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 I uh, have a quote here from the great author and Nobel Prize winner, so it must, must be right. Uh, John Steinbeck, one of the, in my opinion, one of the, the finest writers ever in English, they gave him Nobel Prize in some miserable sod in Sweden or somewhere said so he wasn't much of a writer and, the, and he never wrote another word, you know. Poor old Steinbeck never wrote a word. That was the end of it. So anyway, this is Steinbeck. He's, is this is from Cannery Row. He, there's a sort of whole Cannery Row gang. They're on their way, I think, to catch frogs or something in the, in the Carmel River. And the car they were using, Lee Chung's Ford, breaks, breaks down. In those days, cars did break down. <laughs> Uh, and this is, this is uh, Steinbeck ab about the mechanic whose name was Gay. It says, he was such a wonder, Gay was, the little mechanic of God, the St. Francis of all things that turn and twist and explode, the St. Francis of coils and armatures and gears. And if at some time all the heaps of jalopies cut down Duesenbergs, Buicks, DeSotos and Plymouths <laughs> American Austins and Isata Franchi Franchis Franchinis praise God in a great chorus, <laughs> it'll be largely due to Gay and his brotherhood. Well, a little bit of poetry, finally, for the people who do Louise's thing. She'll be in the great chorus. She's in the sisterhood, Gay's sisterhood. But then, the, then he gets it all going. Another little bit of, a little, another little bit of poetry here. One twist, one little twist, and the engine caught and labored and faltered and caught again. 
Gay advanced the spark and reduced the gas. You don't have to do that these days. <laughs> he switched over to the magneto and the Ford of Lee Chong chuckled and jiggled and clattered happily as though it knew it was working for a man or woman who loved and understood it. See, that doesn't happen. That love, that thing doesn't happen for the nasty old dirty engine, except with our technicians. We'll have a look at it. I bet our engine isn't dirty. No, it isn't. Generally speaking, they keep them perfectly clean. We have 400 people working for Rise for Health in seven countries. All our technicians are fabulous. They come and look after your car and they'll be part of the great chorus. So that's one thing. No, people don't honor this stuff. I'm not a technical person. But the other thing is that people who do going to get this have to come from somewhere. And Andrea, she says, comes from a very distinguished family, and is, as you know, distinguished herself, uh, whose background indeed is in mechanical engineer, in engineering. Her father, Jack, uh, was regarded, widely regarded, as a kind of a genius, as indeed is Andrea. So. But Jack's thing was, <clears throat> what's in an engine? When I was a child, I, uh, I took, took to motorcycling. I, I um, borrowed, actually I kind of stole the vicar's moped. Quite often. <laughs> uh, vicar was an NSU quickly. Andrea's uncle used to ride for the NSU factory in Germany before the war, and then there was a war. <laughs> He was married to a German, which got, really got complicated. But uh, so the NSU, very distinguished, very distinguished uh, company, and all to pieces in the end. But anyway, the vicar, I noticed, uh, said prayers every day, even song, call that in Anglican vicar. So he wasn't using his moped for half an hour or so, and I didn't think it would do any harm if I gave it a bit of a gallop. So, you know, I borrowed it. And I got quite good at it, never wrecked it. And they, although he must have wondered sometimes why the engine was warm when he came out. <laughs> so I, I, and it was all very well. So I, that's the sort of thing I did when I, when I was a child. And then I graduated bike of my own when, on, on my 16th birthday, which was the earliest that I could possibly have it. I often wondered why my mother, for example, hadn't noticed that I passed my test pretty well on my 16th birthday. She never wondered where I got the practice. <laughs> anyway, it was the vicar. <laughs> So uh, I, I was drawn into a brotherhood, actually, whether I liked it or not, because motorcycle reasons were not as reliable then as they are now. And I uh, found myself uh, at a crossroads. In fact, at uh, Beesby Crossroads on the way between uh, Alford and Mablethorpe, where Dennis, where Dennis's parents lived, Mablethorpe man. Beesby Cross, and there was a brick sort of shed. And inside the brick shed was a very nasty little man with a flat hat. And he was a little man, and he had uh, blue overalls called George Stamp. And George Stamp was not like gay because he, I don't think George would ever get any chorus anywhere, but he was a very bad-tempered man indeed. And so we all, those of us who had motorbikes and had something wrong, took them to George because he was the only person who was going to fix it. But in order to get it fixed, we had to undergo a lot of personal abuse. Uh, it wasn't just a question of George, you know, can you... Because George, when we had something broken, George wanted to know how we'd broken it, for a start. You'd think it'd be none of his business, but anyway. <laughs> well, no, how we'd broken it and why, and why we were so careless, and why we couldn't fix it ourselves. So he would actually kind of make us fix it. He would stand over us all and abuse us. Well, I think once I was there and there was nobody else there, he was actually quite nice to me, and I was sort of shocked, you know. But I learned from that. I learned that things don't look after themselves. They, things <laughs> fall apart. And uh, you have to do something about this before you get into the most terrible trouble. So I learned from George, and he's been in my mind ever since. Not a technical person, as I say. Didn't go to the technical school in, in Brooklyn or anywhere else technical. But I learned that reality, and so when indeed we uh, in Somalia saw this particular difficulty, uh, it wasn't a kind of new difficulty to me. I mean, we, we could see what had to be done. Fixing that, however, on a very large scale is another matter. It took, takes now a great deal of intellectual effort. This is not simply a question of waving a magic wand. You don't find yourself 
in charge of leasing, you know, 300 vehicles to a Ministry of Health and running things like the sample transport program by accident. This isn't an accident. It's very complicated and difficult to do. I go around telling people it's easy. We just change a lot of oil filters. But it's not. It's hard. But still, we know how to do it, and we can replicate it all over the place. So now I'm going to, I'm going to put to you, with the assistance of my snake oil boy here, I'm going to put to you the answer, a, a, a possible picture that I want you to hold in your mind, if I can get this thing to work. Those are women at an outreach clinic that isn't failing because there's no transport. That's in the Gambian tell because they're pretty, pretty dresses. Now this is a sheep. <laughs> it's upside down. This is a very unfortunate position for a sheep to get in. Now I have my semantics professor with me. There he is. <coughs> professor Mumby, will you tell us what this condition is? No, this is not, I haven't prepped him at all. What is this condition? That sheep is in the very unfortunate condition of being far off. It is indeed. Thank you, Professor Mumby. He's a right. semantics guy. He knows this stuff. Far welted, that's what we call that in our Lincolnshire dialect. This is a sheep that can't get up. <laughs> it's tipped over and it's swelled up a bit. So it can't get up and it's going to lie there for, uh, till it dies, actually. Uh, it looks to me, see other sheep in the background are very interested in that and they're hoping they're not going to get far welted because they know <laughs> what happens if you do. And I, this sheep in particular, I don't know, it looks to me like sort of UN agency or something, you know, it's just kind of, <laughs> obviously, it's kind of, you know, waiting for someone to come and tip it over, back again, sort of get it going again. And the other sheep look to me a bit like other UN agencies <laughs> watching, <laughs> watching this happen, but really not knowing what to do. See, Dennis and I know what to do. We've, we've corrected far welted sheep. Now, Rise of Health, I've actually got another picture of a really good picture, because this, this is the communal one where the other agencies are wondering. Uh, I've got one here, if it, kind of where am I supposed to Ah, here it is. <laughs> This is a good picture. This is an individual far welted sheep. See, it's got its scent far welted, as we would say in Lincolnshire. And you can see how hopeless that is. And the longer it stays there, the more bloated it gets. And it can't turn itself over. The worse it gets, you see what I mean? The worse it gets. Now, I, I want you to work with me with this image because I think global health, by and large, certainly is in Africa, is far welted. I think the whole thing's on its back. How can you do this stuff if you can't reach anybody? Look at that, uh, the clinic in Zambia just now. <coughs> Didn't really tell half the tale. It was bad, as you could see. But all these women show up and they really get pathetic treatment. It's not the fault of the people running the clinic. They do their very best. They're overwhelmed. They've got nerves. They've got no stuff. I saw uh, the rider, interestingly, coming into that clinic that same day, I think, while, while we're making that film, and uh, on a little Honda. And this is another very important point. This Honda had done more, it's about to stop. Nothing wrong with Hondas, by the way. It was about to break. And it happened on the odometer to have 3,000. This is a really, really important point. 3,000 kilometers. And I happen to know that that Honda landed in Zambia costs about $3,000. Now, without any running costs whatsoever, no running costs in this, just the capital cost to someone, that's a dollar a kilometer. Now, nobody wants to spend a dollar a kilometer. We run motorcycles so they don't break down. I mean, the Gambia, for example, for 26 cents, something like that. So who watched the UN agency wants to stand up and say, you know what, we spend a dollar a kilometer on every single motorcycle that prematurely gets broken, and we don't do any, anything about it at all. We just let it happen. And then there's the running cost, which, you know, the 30 cents in their case, $1.30 a kilometer for running a little motorcycle. 
So this is really serious. You could, you could put all that right and save money. And you could do it. We're not experienced in other continents. But in Africa, other than probably some places that are just too difficult, conflict in DRC or just lack of infrastructure in Guinea-Bissau or something. But pretty well most places, we could do this tomorrow uh, if there were a few around the corner. So that's well over 15 minutes. I, I didn't mean to go on and on. So, are you going to help me with this pitch? <laughs> are you going to hold this in your heads and say, you know what? Global health is far welted. Can you say that? Far welted? Far welted. I'll give you a little Lincolnshire accent with it, if you like, because that's the very posh Oxford pronunciation, but the actual pronunciation is far welted. <laughs> so, that's more difficult. You can't do that. So. <laughs> Work with me on this. Take this away from here, please. I know I've digressed a little, but that's what I do. I can't help it, and I do it in a way on purpose. Because if you're going to do something like this, you can't. It's not a straight line thing. You know, it's just so difficult and so challenging. Everything's unexpected. Digression is just absolutely the key to this. So, far welted. Please bear it in mind, and thank you, by the way, for, for honouring us with this award. Um, it actually keeps us going, this sort of thing. It keeps us, you know, determined in our old age. Not, not, not Andrea's old age, just mine. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Just some time for a few questions. A few questions uh, from the audience for Andrea. Um, so, uh, Scott Fine, I'm a second year MBA student here at Antigua. Um, we've heard over the past sort of month or so from uh, two speakers who had who described what it takes to succeed in this space. And I'd love to hear your take on it. So, we had yesterday. Tom Tierney, the founder of Bridgespan, the social sector consultancy, um, said that wishful thinking is the root cause of mediocrity in this sector. Um, a week earlier, we had Cheryl Dorsey from Equin Green say that a core competency she sees in the social entrepreneur she funds is a willful naivete. Those two things to me seem a little bit at odds. When you look at the world, the work that you do, and the, the work of social entrepreneurs around the world, where, where do you see, you know, what's the right mindset to have? Um, <coughs> thank you. Um, I think it's, to start with, it has to be focused. Because when you look at the developing world, there's so much to be done that you just have to keep focused on one thing. And that's really hard to do because you have to learn to say no uh, to, to some things. And you have to make sure that everything you do is, um, is really looking towards a model that can be replicated either by your own organization or by somebody else's. And I think that the, the two most important things are to think about what the impact is, but how the money works. And, and it's, an inter it's such a, a tension in a social enterprise between money and, it, and impact because just a, just a very a very short um, a story, a, an organization called us a couple of weeks ago an impact, in, impact investors in, in Denmark and they talked to, to us for half an hour about, about the money. They never talked about the impact uh, because it's very hard to keep those two things in mind at the same time. So, but nothing's going to work unless you make the money work. And there's no point in having the money if you're not going to focus it on something very specific and make sure you really are changing people's minds. And I think that there's more to social enterprise than sometimes people give it credit for. It's very much to do with, with, with mind changing. It's to do with getting other people to see the world differently. And in particular, in our case, getting government to be less donor dependent. They've been trained to be donor dependent. That an NGO comes along, they give you money. <coughs> you know, we don't, we don't do that. That's not, that's not the right thing. It's, it's not going to go anywhere if that's the way people go on. So I think it's about keeping the, the tension and the balance between the money and the impact. 
I think it's about keeping focus, and I think it's about making sure you're participating in, not just in telling people about your own work, but about the whole movement of social enterprise. I think it's incumbent upon all of us to work with the social enterprise movement because that's what's going to change the world. And, and I think, um, that's, I agree with Andrea, not just because I always do. I always do, but she's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's competence. It's competence. This is about competence. So, so we we do change a lot of oil filters and a lot. Of, so, but the way we work our system is for all these vehicles. It's absolutely vital that vehicles do not break down, which people think is a wild ambition, an ambition at all. It's a system. If we let vehicles break down. We'll never know how much they cost, we won't be able to do any plan, and then they'll all break down. So if you have a thousand and one, then it's 999, so because you can't control it. It's very important not to let them break down. So to do that, you have to be very competent technically. But you have to have very competent stores people, you have to have very competent accountants, lots of them. You have to have very competent administrators. But if you just take the simple case of a part, part number, you know, you've got a lot of got to change a lot of parts before they break. And, and it's nice if you've only got one kind of vehicle, but that's not going to happen. And actually, even if they're all <laughs> AG200 motorcycles, Yamaha AG200, say, once they age at different rates, they're different vehicles, because you've got to do your interventions at different times. So you, you've got to be really, really good at that. I was struck the other day, because I, 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 one of the old blues guys died, and Part of his story was that he went to he went to Chicago from Mississippi or somewhere, and he was really good. And he showed up. He was going to play with people who drank muddy waters and so on. And this poor guy, just a kid really, but he was brilliant. And they listened to him play a bit, and they said, "Kid, go home, <laughs> go learn to play, and come back. Then you can play with us." So he went home, went back to Mississippi, learned to play incredibly well. And he came back and he got to play with Muddy Waters. <laughs> That's what it's like. You've got to be really, really good at what you do in, in this field. And, and if you've got 17 digits in a part number, <laughs> numbers being what they are, it's really rather important they be in the right order. You know, just 17 random numbers won't do it. Especially when you get out, we have a system called outreach maintenance. We go to where the vehicles are, our technicians. You've got to take all this stuff, all these parts, and a little truck or something. It better be the right parts. And so it's no good wishing. Yes, the wishful thinking. You know, wishing women didn't die in childbirth. You know, yeah, we all wish that, don't we? <laughs> you got to the parts also, right. But I think also, just to, to, to finish that, your point, I, I'm not sure that anything about social enterprise fits into a soundbite. It's complex, it, and it's... You know, the more you're in it, the more complex it really seems to become. And keeping it simple is, is for us the hardest thing, but I think it's important. No help then, really. So when you see that the people in Gambia are running the program, how do you deal with that? I mean, after you go to a country and you start the program, how, how do you find the best people, how, and how do you train them so they can keep motivated and the, the program can keep going on its own? Yes, how, what an important question, uh, and indeed it, the answers. So I'm going to say the strangest thing I've said so far today, um, and that's saying something, but uh, it's the situation somehow produces extraordinary people. Uh, I don't know how, uh, you know, in Africa, everybody believes in God one way or another. I once met a man in Nigeria who didn't, and he's the only one. <laughs> and even he was an animist, so, uh, but, but God sends, God sends the people. I mean, you, if you do something that works, especially in Africa, nobody wants to go backwards and do a horrible thing that didn't really work. Everybody enjoys working in some, look, you know, we're actually not there now, it's just a sheep, but uh, Louise's uniform and her colleagues, and they all look great. They know, the engines are always clean, everything about it's brilliant. And they, they, they want it to be that way. And I think also, if you, if you work in a resource poor country, or any of those expressions, poor country, 
when nothing much works. It's kind of a thrill to be part of something that does work, especially if it's you that's doing it. I mean, we don't do the old expatriate things. There are plenty of technicians in Durham <laughs> could do this job. How would that help? They'd do it for two years and go back to North Carolina. So that's not <laughs> going to help. It has to be built in. And, and then something else happens. I, it, actually, in the Gambia, we've come to the sort of rollover period after the first five years of this leasing program. And uh, it's my job to uh, deal with governments and so on. And uh, Mandarin and I had a meeting with the minister. And the question is, Minister, do you want to do this again? Because we're not paying for it. We couldn't. It's you can pay for it. It's G Gambian citizens' money, or however they acquire it. So, and the, the answer is, uh, his answer was, "Are you nuts? I mean, why would we not do this again?" So we've had five years of doing it. It's a great success. It, you know, the statistics show it. And, it, and then people want to work. For, I mean, in, and, and Rise Health, in general, in a little bit of it in the UK, we have about thirty people doing overseeing stuff and so on, doing money things and all that. But uh, we used to, people didn't really want to work with us, didn't know who we were, what we did. But now if we advertise for a job, I mean, people really will want to come from all over the world and join us, very distinguished people. We have a PhD in our midst, you see. We're not just technicians, there she is, Lakshmi. Do Dr. Lakshmi, we had, don't we? PhD. So, you know, all sorts of people come to join us, all those great girls, you know, fantastic. I, I do think that, that there are some, some other really important things about training, making sure that the mission's really clear, making sure that uh, people are very well trained. And we think that one of the most important things is having our leadership in Africa, looking for talent all the time, and making sure that they are spotting talent and training them up, and making sure that they're really bringing in new apprenticeship, apprentices, so that you're constantly bringing people in, training them, and bringing up the talent. And to make sure that people really know that this is an all African thing, in, in the case of Africa, other continents would be <laughs> similar. But but I think that it is an important system to put in place that you're you're very specifically looking for talent and thinking about training all the time. You mentioned that you were uh, or you struggled with um, reporting and measuring your impact. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, um, who are you trying to report to and what is the disconnect between what they're asking for and what you're mm -hmm. able to well, it's a very interesting question because we, when we started doing what, what, what we do, we assumed <coughs> that if you get, say, the public health worker mobile and she can get to her community over 30 miles within half an hour rather than walking, that that would make a huge difference and so it is. So it needs to be. She can spend a lot of time in the village, she can be more highly trained, you know, that makes a big difference. If you can immunize children and so on. But we find with um, impact measurement that really people, when they measure our work, they're looking at increased productivity, they're looking co at cost effectiveness, they're looking at all sorts of things to do with the system which is fantastic, we're very pleased with that. But nobody seems to be able to enable us to claim any actual health outcome uh, metric. Because they say, well, you know, that's not you that's done it. Well, no, it isn't. But we've enabled the people who do do, who do, do it to get there to do it. So it is it, very difficult for us. And when you talk about the audience that we're trying to persuade or to to illustrate is to um, people are very anxious to have a, an, an emotional connection with the with the beneficiary well we're an intermediary I mean we really are and uh, someone very important in this uh, skull foundation said you know riders for health have got to show that they're the soloists not just part of the chorus well we're how to be part of the chorus. We want to be enabling the soloists to get there, but that's not going to do the, 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 the funders. And, and, and actually, when it comes to impact investment, what we try to do is 
that piece of the equation goes out of the window because what people are interested in is our financial model and the fact that we can get a return on the money. That's okay. But when you look at the philanthropy side, it's very important for us to be able to show health impact and it's very difficult to get people to allow us to have that piece. So anybody that can help us with that, some sort of proxy or so anything that they can help us with, we'd be delighted. Got one last question. Um, so I have a question about the sheep. Um, so I'm never going to get that out of my head. Great. <laughs> so um, my question is that if you could wave a, a magic wand and get the UN to, to move all its money over to you in Africa for global health. Um, what would you do with it? How would you kind of, let's do a dream scenario. And then we'll make it happen. It's pretty easy. Um, <laughs> joking. Um, and then the second part is kind of what you just said. Have you tried to do a randomized control trial where, yeah? OK. We're doing what we're starting with funding by Gates at the moment. And, uh, it's, it's, it's fabulous and it will tell us all sorts of things about health systems. But we're having trouble with saying this health, this, this health outcome is really to do with right health. Okay. But, but thank you for thinking of it. The, the UN question is a good one. Andrea and I have a friend, and I might really get into trouble for this, um, who, who was in charge relatively recently of a UN <laughs> agency believe it or not. And he uh, actually says, and this not a hippie or anything that's in charge of you, he said that uh, the UN agency is a kind of incentivized to put lots of vehicles in the field that break down because they're not responsible and they blame Africa. Oh, it's Africa. Uh, and and they, it keeps their budgets up because it's, and, and they also are terrible, you know, so we get, you have no idea the big holes that we have to drive into and get stuck. But what we'd like them to do, in fact, is to talk seriously with the ministries of health and other agencies that are always involved with in, in every country and say to them, listen, <laughs> what we are going to do is give you the money to pay, this is how we charge, to pay the running cost of all the vehicles in, in a fleet that works. So, they, so a, a UN agency would pay Say an ambulance in the Gambia's fuel's gone up a lot, but it, it's it's 80, 80 cents a kilometer or so, but that includes the replacement forever of the you know it doesn't so they should pay the 80 cents for every kilometer and relieve the government of that burden because the government got plenty of burdens or or negotiate with them some sort of tapering arrangement. So we wouldn't want any actual money from them, but we would like. People to take this seriously, uh, and the UN agencies in particular to take it seriously, because they're so ubiquitous, you can't ever get away from them, even if you want to. <laughs> and, and so there is a way of, we used to do this with the need of the Danish government in Zimbabwe. They, they paid for the Ministry of Health every kilometer, and it worked perfectly. The ministry was responsible. That the need had signed a deal with them. It got mentioned twice in Parliament in Copenhagen as a very good thing to do. So we, all this can be done quite easily, uh, but we don't want to be slushing around in money. We just want the kilometres paid for. And I believe Andrew would like to make a final point. Yeah, I'd just like to say one thing before uh, we, we stop. I, I just think that, um, you know, people are very uh, developed world centric. And I'd just like to put in a little word for African banks. Uh, because our model in the Gambia really works well because uh, we borrowed the money, three and a half million dollars, for our, our financial model, our leasing model in, in the Gambia, from an African bank supported by the Skoll Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship. But we think that people should be engaging with African banks much more than they do and the local banks in whatever country you're all working in. Because actually, at the end of the day, that's what it's going to have to be. It's going to have to be African banks and African ministries. And yeah, that, uh, think about the, the bank issue, because it can't always come from this part of the world. 
So with that, it would be our honor if the case team could join me down front. We'd like to present uh, Rhymes for Health and Andrea and Barry with the 2013 Case Award for Enterprising Social Innovation. these Ravana designs because with all <laughs> recycled glass, recycled materials, and repurposed wow. stuff. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.